Hello, alongside Ryan, sir. I'm Don Helbig, and welcome to the Pick Six podcast by the Attractions Group, where we bring you the latest stories from the attractions and amusement industry. Before we delve into this week's Pick Six, let me remind you you can find us on all your favorite podcast apps Apple, Google, Spotify. You know the drill. Uh, we're also doing a video version on YouTube by searching for the Attractions Group podcast. Don, story number one, kick it well, off. Story number one. Uh, the 2024 Golden Ticket Awards presented by Amusement Today once again celebrated the best in the amusement industry on September 7th, bringing together over 300 industry professionals at the historic Kennywood Amusement Park. Dollywood emerged as the biggest winner of the evening, taking home five awards, including Best Family Coaster and Best Guest Experience. Holiday World and Splash and Safari also had a standout night. Uh, they won three awards, including Best New Innovation for its interactive drone show, Europa Park in Germany took home the coveted Best Park Award, while its new coaster, Voltron, won Best New Roller Coaster. You know, for me, it was an honor and a privilege as an industry journalist to have been uh, one of the voters for this year. And uh, Kenny Wood, you know, they did a fantastic job hosting this event. Yeah, it seems like uh, it's always a good time. There's, uh, you know, the best of the best in the industry are able to showcase. So, it's really cool that you uh, you got to attend, and even cooler that you got to cast your vote for it. That's right. I mean, it was uh, you know, and and really to see the excitement you know from the parks that received these golden ticket awards and how much it means uh, to you know to the park presidents, GMs, um, you know, and the rest of the teams. Uh, you know, that that's fun to watch too. Always. All right. Next up. We're going to Dollywood. Speaking of golden ticket winners, uh, as the crisp fall air begins to sweep through the Great Smoky Mountains, Dollywood stands out as one of the most anticipated events of the season. Running now to October 28th, the annual celebration transforms the beloved theme park into an animal wonderland, capturing the essence of the Smokies in all their fall glory. A highlight of the festival, Great Pumpkin Luminites, has quickly become one of the park's most beloved attractions since, since debut in 2017, earning numerous accolades. Yeah, Ryan, this is one of my favorite events in the industry for the fall. I mean, just fantastic. If you've not been to Dollywood, uh, you know, for their their Harvest Festival, you know, I highly recommend it. Uh, you, you're going to have, you know, some great photo opportunities with all the different, uh, you know, all the decor and the different props and things around the park. The food is fantastic. You know, some great shows, uh, you know, so it's definitely worth the trip to Pigeon Forge to check this out. Yeah. And uh, cannot tell you how beautiful the mountains are during the fall time, right? Oh, yeah. Spectacular. All right. Uh, next up. The skies are getting spookier because Halloween in the Sky is back for happy Halloween weekends at Holiday World. Firefly Drone Shows is bringing 500 drones to light up the night with ghoulish designs of Halloween magic every Saturday night from September 21st through October 26th. Dollywood, or I'm sorry, Holiday World really runs with these drone shows, don't they? I think they know what they have and they're going, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're amazing. I really loved what they did in the summer. Uh and the one they do in the fall, you know, it's spectacular. But just uh, you know, it's just a great way for, you know, families, you know, and you've got maybe some young children of that. Uh, you know, just go enjoy the day, you know, the event that they have during the day and then uh, cap it off at night by watching the drone show on Saturdays. Yeah, and they got the perfect viewing area and stuff. They really have it down. It's very cool. All right, next up. Oh, the new Wicked, the experience is coming to Universal Orlando Resort in Florida next month, ahead of the release of the musical adaptation in late 2024. The new experience will feature Wicked themed merchandise, photo opportunities, props, and decorations. The all new immersive experience and exclusive merchandise will be available at Universal Orlando Resort and Universal Studios Hollywood. The engaging Wicked experience will differ at each of the destinations, but both are designed to capture the imagination and spirit of the breathtaking, breathtaking world of Wicked, allowing guests to express their fandom through fashion and accessories while stepping into the story for the first time ever. Are you, um, well, first of all, it's funny. I sent my girlfriend this big Wicked fan and I sent your daughter this big Wicked fan. Um, but uh, do you think the movie is going to be good? I feel like it's either going to be the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. 
Like, I don't think it's yeah, going to be. I don't, yeah, there's not going to be no in between. It's either going to, uh, you know, be amazing or, or it's going to be a total bomb. Um, I'm always concerned when you tr take something like Wicked, you know, from Broadway mm -hmm. and try to put it into a movie. Uh, it looks like it's, you know, was cast really well. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. So I, I hope it's a success. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about, you know, attractions, this has me really excited. It makes me want to go to Universal uh, to, to uh, you know, to check it out. Big fan of Wicked. And first thing I thought of was my daughter, you know, because she's mm -hmm. a big Wicked fan too. And this is going to be really cool. I mean, it's, it's not quite the you know, Epic Universe in terms of that excitement, but of all the different things that have been announced for the fall, uh, this is right up there for me with all the different roller coasters that have been announced. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with Universal Hollywood, but I know that at Universe, my, my understanding at least, is that at Universal Orlando, it's going to go in Universal Studios where the Hello Kitty store was because they've recently closed that. And uh, the Wicked thing was what was rumored. So it's interesting to see that come to fruition so quickly after I heard that rumor. Um, I, I think that what's funny is, for those who don't know, uh, Wicked is going to be two movies. It's going to be part one and part two. Um, I always thought, the I've seen the musical two or three times, and I always thought it's pretty conclusive at the end of the first act. So it makes every all the sense in the world to make it two movies, you know. I've always thought like what so what if it's got a three hundred million dollar budget and it makes sixty eight million worldwide? Like, do they still have to do part two? You know, there are plenty. <laughs> there are plenty of movies that have uh, cliffhanger endings, but this one is very clearly part one. You know, um, yeah. So that'll be interesting. I, I'm certain it'll make a billion dollars, or it'll. Now, what was your girlfriend Aaron's reaction when you sent this to her? So she's cautiously optimistic because she loves the musical but she's op she's not sure how the movie's going to be and what and about the attraction at universal what was her thoughts on that well uh so the information that we have here is far more in depth from the rumor that we heard that it was going to be a wicked store not like an experience so right. i i didn't really get to like see her in person to tell her this but i'm sure she's going to want to find out when this thing opens and be down there as quickly as possible. Yeah. Big, big yeah. difference between a store with wicked merchandise and an experience, which this, uh, you know, this looks spectacular. I mean, I, I, I got to do it. Oh, I'll be there. Like, I, I think it's, it's phenomenal. Now here's a real question. And I, I, I made this comment and it was taken as a joke. It's not a joke, a wicked house for Halloween horror nights. Do you think that? Uh, do you think that could be done? Yes. Well, because I they think, did. The I, weekend, think, I think. You know. I think they could pull it off. Yes. Well, because the thing though is, uh, I I recently did horror nights, and we didn't really, we haven't really discussed it at all. But uh, the main, the the biggest IP house is the Ghostbusters Frozen Empire house, and that house is like, it, it's phenomenal right off the bat. It's phenomenal, but it's not super scary. It's more like you really feel like you're walking through the movie. And I think that if they can create something like this and make it more like mystical and, and stuff and yeah, I think that they can do it. I, I in fact, I, I think that it would be the strongest IP, one of the strongest IPs they've ever had if they're able to pull this oh, off, absolutely. especially if it, if it gets, uh, you know, a positive reputation, but moving right along. All right. Well, celebrating its 50th anniversary this month, the hoop de do musical review at Disney's Fort Wilderness Resort has been carving up good old fashioned fun and hearty dinners for hungry park guests inside Pioneer Hall as one of the longest running dinner shows in the country. It debuted in 1974, initially as a seasonal summer show. And then on September 5th of that year, it became a permanent fixture at Walt Disney World Resort. Since then, more than 12 million guests have enjoyed over 41,000 performances of this iconic review. With three shows held every Wednesday through Sunday, the kitchen at Pioneer Hall, well, they stay busy. Each evening, the chefs serve up to 900 pounds, this is again, each evening, up to 900 pounds of golden fried chicken, more than 400 pounds of succulent pork ribs, and 30, pound, or 30 gallons of baked beans, ensuring guests have left satisfied after a night of great entertainment and even better food. Now, Ryan, uh, this has a special... Uh, meaning for me because uh, this was the first uh, my first ever 
trip to Walt Disney World that I made. Uh, this was something that, uh, you know, we stayed at the Wilderness Lodge and then we went over and we, we saw this and uh, had the food and that fried chicken off the charts good. So, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, to be celebrating 50 years this fall, uh, that's quite a remarkable run. Anything, any, especially a show at Disney lasting that long is pretty darn impressive. Um, cause even the stuff that staples, you know, there's always the risk of budget cuts. There's always the risk of, um, you know, we can put an IP in. That's the risk recently. It's like hoop did you review? That's great. And people love it, but we could really put in a Kanto show there, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. like that, that would, that's the risk that, that you run nowadays with the current Disney, but um, that's really cool. I haven't seen it yet. I've always heard about it. I've actually, next made, time you go, it. next time you go, make sure you do it because you know, the show's fantastic, but even better than that, you know, is the food, the fried chicken, outstanding, you know, the, the rest of it that comes with the meal. I mean, it's the ribs. I mean, just really, really good. Uh, it's, it's a great value. You're going to leave there feeling that you had a great time and it was worth, you know, your time and your money. And you can write a hoop to do review about it on your blog if you want, Don. That's right. All right. Moving right along. Uh, so in Central Florida, Halloween has already kicked off with Halloween Horror Nights, uh, the Mickey's Not So Scary uh, Halloween Party, as well as Hollow Scream at SeaWorld. Uh, I was actually able to attend two of the three, did not make it out to Hollow Scream, but uh, spent four nights at uh, Halloween Horror Nights. I, I bought a pass that was good for all of September. So it's not like I, um, you know, stayed all night, right. all four nights. But um, so we did Mickey's Not So Scary. Uh, that was on Labor Day. Uh, fantastic experience. Um, it, it's weird. I, I talked about this on the last show, I think, where it's identical to the Christmas one, but it's Halloween because right. they know the formula and they just go with it, you know? So all the places where you can get treats, you can, uh, for Christmas, you can trick or treat for Halloween. They've got a fireworks show at the same time as Christmas for Halloween. They've got a stage show at the same, you know, it's the same kind of stuff, parade and everything. Uh, really, really cool experience. Horror Nights was very neat this year. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was definitely the best house. Uh, Insidious was really neat. It was another one that was a little bit scarier, uh, but also a good experience of um, like, you know, going into the movie itself. And then the other IP that they had was A Quiet Place. Uh, which was very well done. Um, basic storyline behind that is there's some sort of monster out there. And if you make any noise, it'll get you. So that's why, you know, it's a quiet place. But uh, they did essentially, it's kind of like, how do you make a house out of this? Well, the house has no ambient music or anything. Um, and then you'd see somebody come out, maybe holding a baby, you hear a baby crying. And then there's a scare coming from the other side because they get the baby or whatever. So uh, definitely cool experience. Halloween starts earlier and earlier in Central Florida. I think Mickey's not so scary. It starts in like mid-August. Um, if you want scary stuff, but you still want uh, mid-July temperatures, then Central Florida is the place to be right now because it was hotter than heck down there. You know? Yeah, so Ryan, uh, you mentioned the treats and that it, Mickey's not so scary Halloween. Did you get lots of candy? Yeah, I got a ton of candy, and I'm not a big fan of having candy laying around because then I'll be tempted to eat it. Uh, I ate a ton of it while I was there, but we stayed with a friend of mine. And what I was doing was I took pieces of candy and hit them all around his house. So I told him it was an incentive to clean his house was he'd find all the candy. Yeah. Yeah, some some <laughs> stuff he's not going to find for like <laughs> until he moves, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. But if you, okay, now that you did these events um, for someone that's thinking about going and they mm -hmm. can't decide universal Disney, whatever, if there's one thing, in each of those parks, you know, you do go, but there's one thing that is can't miss. You absolutely have to do this. What are they? For each event? Yeah, for each one. Yeah. So uh, for Mickey's Not So Scary, there, there's a trio of events and it's whatever one kind of, I, I'd say you have to do all three, either that or you haven't really done the event. But um, the fireworks are always a home run. The fireworks were particularly good. Um you know, and it was, they had trippy stuff projecting on the, on the, the castle and so on. So it was pretty fun. Um, the parade is another one that's that the parade hasn't changed in years. And it seems like if they ever did change it, then they'd be in trouble because everyone loves it. Um, and then they've got that stage show um, on the 
the castle stage uh, with the Sanderson sisters. Sanderson. I was going to ask you about them. Yeah. How did you like that? Uh, that was my first time seeing it. I, I, so I knew about the show, but I didn't know the premise of it. So I thought it was so cool when like they had cameos from like Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas and Maleficent and like, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it, the show was almost like the Christmas show too, because it was Mickey and Minnie having a Christmas party. And then it was just random people making cameos like the Los Cabreros showed up. I mentioned that for Christmas, but uh, yeah. that show was really cool. And the music's really strong too, because the music from, um, you know, uh, from Hocus Pocus is really strong. Um, but overall, really enjoyable events. You know, it's if you go early, it's not horribly expensive. I think it's like $130 a ticket. So you pay for it, um, but you do get a less crowded Magic Kingdom and uh, special entertainment and so on. You go closer to Halloween, you're going to get up in the $200 range, though. Uh, but for Horror Nights, um, so here's the thing. With Horror Nights, you have to do what they call stay and scream. And what that is, is if you're already in the park when... Horror Nights opens, you can go into this corralled area and they let you in line for the mazes before they open to the public. Um, you have to have a, a, you have to have valid admission for the day. So I've got an annual pass. So I could just scan my pass and go in and then go directly to the stay and scream area. But mm -hmm. basically saying um, you go in, uh, you know, they, I think stay and scream starts at five. And then 5.30 or so, they open up some of the mazes. They let you get in line. So you end up waiting like 25 minutes. So the people that just buy a ticket, scan and come in have, you know, sometimes an hour wait right when they walk in the door for the more popular mazes and stuff. Um, we're talking about forking out a lot of money no matter what. Uh, Express is a really good way to do it. Uh, for me, it's just like there are very few haunted houses where I'd wait 90 minutes, 120 minutes to do. Um, the, the express pass gets you in a much shorter line. Uh, we did that for one night for the first night. And that was just a guarantee that we could do all the houses. But, um, if you're going to go to horror nights, you don't want to do that casually. You have to plan for it and budget for it. And, um, you know, I even did a backstage tour. It's called behind the screams. Uh, no, sorry. Behind the screams is something different. It was unmasking the horror where they took okay. us through three of the houses and walked us through and let us take pictures and told us the backstory and stuff. So I'm not like a big, huge Halloween person, like some of the people um, that, you know, that are out there that just wait for the like, countdown until haunts. Yeah. They live, they live for that season. Right. I I'm so not that, but I'm also like interested in their storytelling and interested in seeing the pro because everything's so detailed and everything has such a backstory and you don't get much of that at all when you're going through the house. So yeah. that's why I'm interested in that. I'm not like a big, like, you know, I don't got a Jack Skellington tattoo or anything like that. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen the movie Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, but yeah, I would say the main thing is, is the stay and scream and or the express pass is probably the direction to go. Um, it's hard to say like which house you have to do. I, obviously, if it's this year, uh, Ghostbusters. If you don't do Ghostbusters, you wasted your money because Ghostbusters is the premium A plus experience there. Mm -hmm. um, everything else is is really good, but that's the one where it's like, okay, if I waited an hour for this, I'd probably be all right with that. You know, cool. Okay, all right. Let's move on to the listener questions. Um, so the first listener question, Steve asked from Auburn. Massachusetts. He goes, get well soon, Don. That I'm sorry to hear your summer ended like this, losing sight in your eye. At least you got in lots of adventures and made good memories before it happened. My question is, what is it about the Phoenix at Knobles that gets it the Golden Ticket Award every year? It's fun and all, but better than The Voyage, Beast, El Toro, Ravine Flyer 2? Valid question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, first, thanks for the, the thoughts there. But um, you know, when you're looking at the Phoenix, I mean, it's a fantastic ride. Let's not take anything away from it. Uh, you know, just a fantastic, you know, coaster all the, all the way around. Uh, it deserves to be, you know, at number one. It's won several years in a row now. So, I mean, it, it deserves its place. But I think one of the things that really, you know, helps it garner some votes and that is the nostalgia piece of it, that it is old school. It's got the buzz bars that's mm -hmm. going to um, enhance the airtime moments a little bit better you know you get a little bit 
uh, better airtime when you're not clamped in with those individual lap bars and seat belts and all those kind of things. So I, I think that plays into it a little bit. Uh, I think by anyone's measure, you know, if it had individual lap bars, I mean, it's still going to be, you know, in that top two, three kind of range because it's that good. Uh, but no, I, I think, you know, Knobles, uh you know, great coaster that they have there, uh, well-deserved with their golden ticket awards. And if you have not ridden it, and I haven't ridden it a lot, uh, but if you've not ridden it, uh, you know, make a special effort to get out to Knobles and and uh, take a ride and see for yourself why it's number one. Yeah, it's consistently voted number one. So all those people can't be wrong, can they? All right. right. Uh, Maury T from Detroit, Michigan. Do you think Top Thrill 2 will make a triumphant return in 2025, or do you think it will continue to have problems? You know, yeah, Crystal that's a million-dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got, um, they're going to, Zamperla is doing everything they can to resolve the issues. You know, it looks like they revolve around, you know, the trains, the wheel bearings and, you know, all in that area. So I think they're going to do everything they can uh, to resolve that. Um, my hope is that they're not in a big rush just to, you know, open it on opening weekend next year, just to have it open. And then you have issues again. I would take as much time for both, you know, Cedar Point and Zamperla uh, to make sure it's right. And it's going to be reliable before you open it again. You, you cannot have another situation where it opens. And then a couple of weeks later, it's down for several weeks down for the season again, because you encounter more issues. I mean, you got to make sure it's right. No matter how much testing you need to do, you know, just do it. If you're a fan of Cedar Point, have patience. You know, this is a prototype. You know, Sam Perla's first time, you know, doing something of this magnitude. Uh, just have some patience. And I do think in time they'll figure it out. I think one of the questions that I got, you know, that I saw a lot of, especially when I was in Pittsburgh for the Golden Ticket Awards is, you know, that reopens next year. Does that count as a new ride again? Uh, I say no. It's year two for Top Thrill 2 if it opens. It's like Aaron Rodgers, you know, played four snaps last year for the, Green, or for the New York Jets. Got injured. Well, you know, this is year two for him for the Jets. He was out all last year. So I think the same kind of rule applies with with rides that uh, starts the season, you know, operates a couple of days, a few days, goes down. It's not new anymore. You know, it's just year two for it. How many cycles does it have to run before that's kind of because uh, could this be a red shirt freshman situation? <laughs> no, no, no red shirt uh, situation. Uh, but no, I really I think it's. I think they'll figure it out, uh, but I think it's going to take take time. And I, 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 you know, don't bank on it being ready to go on opening day next year. Just give it as much time as Cedar Point needs to to make sure it's right. Yeah. So uh, our friend Ryan, the ride mechanic, who's been on the show before, um, you know, he, uh, you know, as the name implies, his name is Ryan, so he knows everything. Um, he was a ride mechanic, so he he has a very interesting intake. He doesn't. Um, he doesn't work for Zamperla or for Cedar Fair or anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's in the industry anymore. But he put out a video with his opinion on it because there's a lot to yeah. digest now. And um, yeah, and that's a must-watch video, by the way, Ryan the mechanic. Watch what he has to say. Yeah, it's uh, if you're not following him, what are you doing? But anyway, um, but he he said he had his reasonings and stuff. And again, he's on the outside looking in, just like the rest of us. But he theorized, speculated that um, the the lightning trains were more top heavy than the Intamin trains, and what they didn't account for was putting human bodies in it. It shifts the weight so much that sure, that was yes. causing the the thing. I, it causes the wheels to wobble. I think he said to see little shimming. Yeah, he had some sort of term that they use in the industry for it because he said the complicated part of it is you can launch forward all you want and it doesn't matter because you point the wheels in to get it straight, but they're going forwards and backwards. So you don't have that advantage. Um, but he also he said that the reason why they're probably scanning the top hat with the black lights and stuff, it, he's like, that doesn't sound like NDT. He said they're scanning the whole thing to put it into CAD to get a perfect mm -hmm. simulation. But he also had his reasonings to believe that they were going to replace all the track in the top hat and stuff. So it'd be very interesting to see 
um, if what he speculates comes true. Uh, he he was one of the, I mean, the wheel bogeys thing was the rumor right off the bat, but he was the first person to come out and say like, yes, it's certainly the wheels. And then, you know, I think uh, we can only speculate, but, you know, they fixed the wheels. They found another problem. They fixed that. They found another problem. That that fix caused another problem. It, it's going to be a lot of stuff. But um, I think ultimately the thesis of what he was saying was they need to beef up the trains. You know, it's uh, it's it's just, you know, they're light, aluminum, weld-free, and that's great, but we're going 120 miles an hour now backward, you know. Right. Not it, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, I I'm confident it'll be ready for opening day. I've got a feeling that that's because I, nowadays when it's kind of like this is not going to open, they can take the trains back to Italy. They can tear them. He was saying that they they'll probably rebuild them, but it won't be like super expensive because you can reuse the lap bars, reuse the seats. Yeah, it'll look like that. the same trains. Yeah, to the, well, to the maybe or to be super bulky compared to it, you know. Yeah, but it'll look like the appearance will look the same. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be a major um, difference, but uh, I guess your, Maury, your guess is as good as ours is the best way to put it. But um, I would say, if I was a betting man, I would say fifty-five percent chance it's ready for opening day. Uh, it'll certainly open next year. Um, yeah. But there's also like they run the risk of the unforeseeable where the train is perfect and then there's something else. You know, the train's a little heavier, so now it's underpowered with the LSMs and stuff. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm just speculating in my head, but you know, we're rooting for him. But when it opens, it has to work. It has to work. And when it does, it'll be one of the best rides out there. I oh, never no got question. to ride it. We, yeah, from what you and I hear, yeah, it'll it'll it was fantastic. And uh, I feel you know you and I it was a missed opportunity that we didn't get to. But uh, you know, hopefully, next year we get to ride it. Exactly. All right, we'll be next back next week with some more topics and news and interviews and all sorts of cool stuff so make sure you follow us on all your favorite podcast apps apple google spotify and so on um we're on youtube search for the attractions group podcast and follow us on x at attractions underscore grp we will see you next week everybody